The stock market is crazy and chaotic. Crash. You suck. Oh, God. Hold on. Pause. <laughs> Brad and Fat Man Zoom are here to help you own it. They were targeting Wall Street when they should have been targeting Capitol Hill. They should have been targeting DC. This is the same thing, and this is what people keep missing. Taking it to the suits, being relatable and hilarious. You bought GameStop at 400, didn't you? To the moon, baby, to the moon. Get ready to own the chaos in three, two, one. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the chaos. My name is Brad. The stock market is crazy and chaotic, and I made it my mission to help you all own it. Guys, what is going on? I got a special show for you guys today. I can't wait to have Chris from Strongman Personal Finance come on the show in just a few minutes. But as always, you know how it is. Let's hit up the starting five. We got John Musil, Tiger's Edge, Philip Stro, Omar, and Shane Haley. Shane, it's good to see you, man. I haven't seen you in a little bit. Tune in. So um, it's good to see you in here. <clears throat> we got the futures right now that are kind of just flat, really boring. S&P is up three and a half whole dollars. Uh, the Dow's up 0.02%. So it's pretty boring. Nothing going on on the oil front. Still up slightly around one one and a quarter percent 106 dollars we're back over 100 dollars a barrel on oil but guys as as i had mentioned before got a special guest i asked you guys in the community who should i have on as far as guests are concerned and overwhelmingly i got a really positive response for chris and so let's go ahead and bring him on what's up my man whoa what's up <laughs> yeah. good to see you bro so um a lot of people asking me uh, uh to have you on we chatted for a little bit earlier in the week and uh for those people who don't know who you are i want you to go ahead and uh give them a little snapshot of uh where you come from what's your background and, and what you do sure so i actually have a youtube channel I don't, know, I don't know if you guys knew this but it's called strong man personal finance okay and basically my background well i used to be in the army and then i got out became a financial advisor and I discovered that was a very disgusting career field. And I quickly quit that job and I became an accountant. So now I'm a certified public accountant working for a tax firm in the middle of this season. And I run my, run my YouTube channel where I talk mostly about Boglehead investing. Now, if you have no idea what that is, that's where you basically just buy index funds and don't time the market. And it's very boring and, you know, yawn inducing. But that's what I do. And I also like to make fun of uh, some content creators that I think are doing some very bad things to people's portfolio. So that's that's basically me in a nutshell. Yeah, I was uh, noticing some of the back and forth between you and uh, and, Amit, and Amit Kevin, and some of the other guys as well. Me, Kevin actually ended up having you, I guess, on a bit of a troll, uh, I don't know, um, video, if you will, which, I mean, I don't know how anybody was uh, on the same side as Kevin was when he sold his entire portfolio uh, and kind of the scrutiny he got. It seemed as if the pressure got to him, and that's why he bought back in, not necessarily because he was accurately timing the market. It seemed a bit, of, a little bit like it was luck. Uh, but nevertheless, he made uh, made sure that you were in there as far as the brum the joke was concerned. Yeah, he, uh, me and him have a love-hate relationship. I mean, so when I first started criticizing him after he sold all his stocks, I mean, yeah. my, my, for my channel, I got a lot of views. And I, I guess I caught his attention. And then I noticed that, you know, every time I put out a video on him, he would comment almost instantly. So he was definitely, you know, watching all my criticisms of all his decisions, you know, right. basically as soon as they came out. It eventually got to the point where I invited him on the channel for a lively debate slash conversation and he accepted. And then we did that and we became best buddies ever. Now he calls me a step bro. That's how close we are. <laughs> and so, but somehow I still made it in his troll video. Though. That kind of hurt my feelings because I thought we uh, settled all our differences, but apparently not. Yeah, and I actually kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit, not necessarily from the uh, <laughs> from from that perspective, but more on this pr perspective of just what he actually did. So if you guys didn't catch that, you know, Kevin for me, Kevin uh, sold all of his uh, portfolio, all the, all of his holdings or he as he claimed 99 percent of his uh, portfolio um, back in January. Uh, expecting the, the stock market to crash. And I felt as if at the beginning of it, uh, Chris, that like when he was talking about it, he was talking about a huge, giant, big ass crash. And I think there was a little bit of backpedaling in there because now he was now he claims that he told everybody that he was going to get back in March. There's a lot of content that I actually watched personally just because I wanted to get my head around this. But he was talking about 
you know, not actually originally not actually getting back until late next year or maybe uh, late this year because he expected some huge giant crash to take place because we're in this big ass bubble. And so um, to me, it seems as, as though it was a little bit. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to say cringy, but it just kind of seemed like it was a little misleading based off of what he was actually doing. And I kind of want to, and now I guess it looks like he's a genius, but I kind of wanted to, to communicate to our viewers as well is that like, that's, that's really not, at least in my opinion, the best way to go about investing at all or really handling your money or $20 million or, or a thousand dollars. It doesn't really matter. Um, but you know, trying to time the market like that really doesn't work out for most people. And I would venture to say that Kevin got lucky more than anything else. And I would argue he didn't even get lucky. I mean, it, to me, it's still too early to celebrate. I mean, we're what, in March? I mean, the stock market could crash tomorrow. We don't know. Yeah, nobody, right. can, nobody can really predict a stock market crash. I know all these exactly. gurus on YouTube try to tell you that. Nobody can do it. So right. in my opinion, he's celebrating too early. And what people also don't realize is when he sells his portfolio at a gain, he's paying massive taxes. He lives in California, so he's paying capital gains tax there. That's like up, I guess, 13%. And then he's paying a lot of short-term capital gains taxes, which for the federal government, which is like 37%, plus an additional tax, he's paying over 50% of his gains in taxes. So when he says he sells something at a gain or he timed the market perfectly, what you don't see is the massive tax bill that he's going to get next year. So he didn't make any money at all, in my opinion. He probably lost money. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a fair point as well. Um, I think that there's definitely something to that. You know, I didn't even consider uh, the California taxes as well um, and how that might, you know, impact uh, his portfolio and, and, and all of that. So that makes a ton of sense. And I mean, speaking of timing and not being able to time anything, I mean, I'm, I, I talk about that all the time that I'm terrible at, at actually making, at actually timing the market, but I, I make educated decisions based off, off of how something's, how far something's gone, come down and fundamentally how well uh, is the company and and uh and you kind of have done that as well on alibaba so as you guys saw the the title uh you know can we trust alibaba and some of the other chinese stocks and i kind of wanted to get pick your brain as far as that's concerned because as we heard last week china is willing to play ball and and lift some of the crackdowns on on some of the stocks that are uh publicly listed in the u.s and you're a, a big fan and and have, have some high conviction in in stocks like alibaba uh, and so I kind of wanted you to touch on that a little bit because I'm actually in the camp of, you know, I'm not sure if I'm ready to trust it just yet, but I think it would be important for uh, our folks to kind of hear your perspective a little bit on, on that as well and, and why you actually own it. Well, number one, I'm actually a closet communist. So basically everything that <laughs> China does, I'm 100% behind. <laughs> but in, in reality, to me, it's a very simple formula. China is an emerging superpower. They want to be recognized as an emerging superpower. And the last thing I think they want is for some of their greatest companies to just be slaughtered and not trusted in the market. And what they also want is Western money flowing into China. So if it gets to a point where nobody wants to give China money anymore, that's actually bad for their economy because they can't grow as quickly. Right. So their action to reassure people was you know, 100% predictable because that's what they want. On top of that, I mean, yeah, there are some companies that are really shady in China. I'm not going to say that's not the case. And some people have been completely screwed. And if you want to play around with Chinese stocks, I would say stick to the bigger ones. You know, the big companies, Alibaba, JD, Tencent, whatever. Some of the smaller companies, yeah, they can be total scams. Kind of like a lot of penny stocks in the United States. But, I mean, if you look at China in the long run, they're an emerging superpower. Their economy is growing much faster than the United States. They have a huge population moving into the middle class. I really think that a lot of these big companies that are already dominant in China are going to benefit from that whole, you know, demographic shift. Oh, I see a chart there. Yeah. Yeah. So I just kind of wanted to show like how, how Bob has been performing. Um, you know, obviously it's down right now around uh, 60% from its highs. Uh, and it just recently had like a 40, 50% move um over the last uh but this is the weekly chart so over the last week it's had uh you know a pretty sizable move um and i actually wanted to just speak to that as well so i appreciate that insight my thing is though too i have two questions um one of them and you've talked about this on your channel is that uh you're not necessarily uh taking this recent move as as really anything because of your long-term view on baba in general which i certainly appreciate my other qu and so you know what are your thoughts on where it may be moving from here? Or does that even matter to you? And my second question is in response to what you were just speaking to, have you considered, you know, 
or do you think that there is little risk involved with, you know, obviously some of the geopolitical tensions with China and Taiwan, uh, and there's a lot of he headlines uh, that are being being made in regards to that. Do you think that there's any inherent risk involving owning Baba if, if anything like that takes place? Well, I, I would say there are massive risks. I'm not going to say, oh, it's just so easy. Just buy it. And, you know, it's a guaranteed 10 X or whatever. No, I mean, obviously, you know, we're the world's superpower in the United States and China's an emerging superpower. We've had trade tensions. I mean, people are concerned about Taiwan. There's a ton of things you have to consider on, on top of the, uh, you know, the VIE structure, which because basically you don't actually own Alibaba. You basically own a contract in the Cayman Islands. So there's a lot of stuff that weighs down on the price of Baba. I don't look at it as a short term trade. In my opinion, I think 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road. Do I think that this huge company that's highly profitable and one of the fastest growing economies in the world, an emerging superpower. Do I think in 30 years, 20, 30, 40 years, do I think I'm going to get a great return? And in my opinion, I think I will. Now, there, there might be massive volatility, and I could also be 100% wrong, which is entirely possible. Right. That's why I don't put a lot of money into individual stocks. But I think if my thesis is correct, I think I will make a lot of money in the long run. But I'm not going to sweat. If the stock goes down to $50 tomorrow, I personally don't care because I think I got it at a great price and I'm willing to wait and be patient and eventually reap the rewards sometime, hopefully in the future. Gotcha. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, and, and I was looking as well. I mean, I did a little bit of, I wouldn't say a deep dive, but I, I looked at a pretty decent amount of, uh, of, of your content and, and really just to be clear. So everybody else is watching too, like Baba doesn't take up uh, a significant amount of your portfolio at all. And in fact, you're in the, uh, uh, Vanguard uh, Global Trust, correct? Yeah. So my portfolio is 95% uh, the VT ETF, which is the Vanguard Total World Stock Market Index ETF. What that means is I own every stock in the world at market cap weight. So I own Apple, Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent. I already own all of these stocks. And the bigger the company is on, in market value, the bigger it is as a part of my portfolio. Now, the reason I own this is because I don't really believe people can time the market successfully in the long run. But what I want to do over the long run in 30, 40, 50 years is grow my wealth as the world becomes wealthier, which I think is a pretty good bet unless we you know, annihilate ourselves in a nuclear war. So I literally just buy this every two weeks, never sell it, never time the market. I do it in tax advantage accounts, IRA, 401k. And I focus more on my savings rate than I do on, you know, trying to make a ton of money. But then I have Baba, you know, 5% of my portfolio is in like the fun stocks. Like, oh, maybe I'll gamble on Baba to kind of get that, you know, that urge out of my system. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. And I think that that's what a lot of us, um, you know, have. I think people have that urge to just kind of take something and they can take on a little bit of risk. But I actually like this approach. I mean, uh Obviously, the VT has done ex extremely well uh, along with the rest of the market. I mean, we can see back in obviously 2020 what happened there, but it, it's been moving really well. Uh, and of course, you could have made uh, more on just investing in individual stocks, but this is a perfect way to manage risk while also uh, experiencing some pretty decent sized gains and in, in gaining wealth for yourself. I really, really appreciate that. Um, my thoughts are, are, are a couple of questions I have. And so, uh, Guys, let me know what you uh, are, are thinking about as well. If you guys guys have any questions for Chris, put them in the chat. Um, and thanks for the for the donate, whoever you is. Somebody and, said horrible approach. That really hurts my feelings. <laughs> I don't know, man. There's always haters <laughs> every, every, every day. Um, but actually, I had, I had some questions too, just in the general overall market. You know, there's obviously plenty of uh, researchers out there and analysts. And I always equate analysts, especially ones that are, are parts of major banks and hedge funds as, as weathermen, because they're about as reliable as weathermen are. However, I do really like um, certain research uh, uh uh, companies such as like Fundstrat, Tom Lee, and I know that he kind of gets a bad rap because he's just kind of one of these perma bulls. But most of the time, and and not every, not all the time, uh, he's right. And I think that there's something to be said. So, is there any part of your, uh, I guess, investing or, or mode of investing that ever involves you taking any kind of risk off, especially if like the market gets too hot? Or does that not matter to you? No, honestly, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it may sound crazy to some people, but. I'm, I'm not joking when I say I think 30, 40, 50 years out. I mean, yeah. I've been buying VT for the last 10, 12 years. And 
yeah, I haven't beaten Tesla and I haven't beaten the U.S. stock market, but I think in 30, 40, 50 years, I think VT will be much, much, much higher. And I'll avoid paying any kind of taxes and I'll avoid any massive losses by not selling at a bad time or putting a lot of my money in the stock that I think is good. I mean, even I think Bob was good, but I could be wrong. I can avoid massive losses by not putting a lot of money into stocks like that. Yeah. What makes you think that um, the global economy economy will outperform uh, the U.S. economy uh, in the long run? Honestly, it's a simple matter of numbers. I mean, I mean if you look back in history, we, the international markets and U.S. markets have gone in cycles where the U.S. is outperformed, international is outperformed, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. Now, recently, the U.S. market has done extremely well. Like We've had insane returns over the last yeah. 10 or 20 years, you know, excluding the crashes. So a lot of people, they I think all they do is they look at the recent past performance and they say, well, U.S. stocks did better, you know, the last 10 years. So I should just be all in U.S. stocks. And to me, that makes absolutely no sense because you just yeah. have to go back and look at history. So by having a, a globally diversified portfolio, you're still in the United States but you're also exposed to international stocks. And on top of that, if you look at the U.S. economy in real terms, we're not going to be growing that quickly going into the future. We're really not. Right. Not to say that our economy is not going to be strong and we're going to have you know, you know, know, stocks that still go up in value. But I think a lot of the growth, I mean, it's actually a fact, is going to be in Asia and then eventually way down the road in Africa and India. So that's... That's why I like having international stocks. I may underperform in the short term, sure. But in 30, 40 years, I think I'm going to beat most people that are trying to you know, get in the U.S. when it's doing good and then selling out of it after it does bad and jumping international when it's doing good. You avoid that timing thing where you can easily make a mistake by just owning the whole world and letting it ride. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense, especially, you know... <sighs> I think sometimes you, a lot a lot of people overlook the emerging markets in general, and there there are times where obviously they can be very volatile and outperform the market or outperform the U.S. markets uh, hand over fist. And we've actually seen that recently, where the emerging markets up until you know the uh, the uh, Russia Ukraine crisis, emerging markets were actually outperforming significantly. So um, it makes a ton of sense um, as far as as far as that that's concerned. I have a couple of comments here. Uh, Oliver Thorpe, what's up, my man? Says uh, my long-term approach is to hold certain stocks outright, but but move profits S and P 500 e ETF or the SPY. I do believe I should have a decent part of the portfolio in ETFs as standard. Uh, what do you think about that? I think that guy's a maniac. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I mean that that's not a bad approach. I mean, I I like 95 percent VT, five percent individual stocks. You can be 100 percent VT if you want. You can be 80% VT, 70%, it's all up to you and your investing strategy. But I would caution people that you're not as smart as you think you are, right? I'm not as smart. I can't under, I don't understand the global economy to a great detail. I don't think anybody has the capacity to do that. That's why I say you should have a big chunk of your portfolio in global index ETFs. And then whatever risk tolerance you're willing to take, you can do it in individual stocks. But don't make a mistake of, thinking you're a genius because U.S. stocks went up recently and going basically almost 100% individual stocks because you can make a massive mistake and that will set you back basically forever. Yeah. You don't want that to happen because eventually you want to retire. I mean, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> maybe. Uh, the, I mean, maybe. Sometimes I, don't, sometimes I think about if I'm, I'm, if I'm actually going to retire or do I already feel like I'm retired? I mean, doing this YouTube thing is... But you so want the option to, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. maybe... I have that backup in case I get tired of all this crap. Right. hundred <laughs> percent. Um, this is interesting too. Uh, shock city rocker says uh, the only reason I don't think 40 years out is because I'm almost 50 years old. I ain't got that much time that, for them gains. And I, that's an interesting point to, to make. Like, do you see yourself continuing just to just own the VT well into retirement? Or do you think that that's going to shift when you get older? So I will, I will always have VT. The only thing that will shift will be, I'll probably I'll probably dump all my individual stocks. I'll probably be too old and all timery to really <laughs> do that kind of stuff. Yeah. But what I'm going to do is have more short term bonds in my portfolio. Now people laugh at bonds because oh you know they're stupid and they don't go up and inflation blah 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 blah. Yeah. The whole right purpose now. of bonds is to it's basically like a cash equivalent, especially the shorter the duration of the bond, the shorter the term, 
the less volatile it is to interest rates. So you want to have bonds in your portfolio as you get older because you can actually draw from that to you know finance your current living expenses. But I'll, I'll probably have like six, 50, 60% VT and then 40% short-term bonds. And that's basically going to be my portfolio. Boring, but it works. Yeah, and it's it's much safer that way um, in the long run too, especially if you're getting into retirement age when uh, you know you can't you have to be a little bit more risk averse than even even at fifty. Uh, I mean, I think that when you get to your sixties, you start to uh, get to that age. I think where you actually are able to retire, um, and uh, I think that you know obviously having the safer route certainly makes a ton of sense. I'm looking at uh, Baba again. Forward PE is at 13 times next year's earnings. And Chris Wells just asks, uh, is the Chinese government backing up Alibaba a good time to buy? And we just talked about this, Chris. Um, but as far as like timing it, certainly uh, this is a little bit of a different conversation with Chris. But uh, I think uh, with, with uh, Strongman Chris. But uh, I think when we look at this, I mean, I, I don't, is there risk for this coming down? For sure. But with 13 times next year's earnings, it's come down, uh, what, 60%? Even, even with the move that it's had, it's still down 60% from its highs. And it's still stupid cheap when you compare it to some of the other uh, e-commerce platforms out there when you're talking about Amazon and Shopify especially. Uh, but Etsy, you name it, some of the other ones that have really high lofty valuations. And you can make the argument that Alibaba should be very much in that conversation. Uh, the only reason that it's down as far is because of the Chinese government, which honestly, of course, is a big risk. But I think the risk reward here, even with the recent move from Alibaba, it's still good. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll caution people. If you think you're going to get a short term gain from Alibaba, I would not even touch that stock because the Chinese government could come out tomorrow and do something stupid. Yeah. And that stock, I mean, because people buy it based on sentiment not really fundamentals, that stock could plummet. I mean, you really got to be patient and wait and for the you know for the long run to really potentially reap some rewards. So I'm not the guy to tell you, oh, you buy it. I think it's going to pop in the next two months. I have right. no idea where that stock's going to go. I'm thinking way longer than that. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate the perspective and uh, I appreciate your time, man. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, you know, with, with, that, with not having Fat Man Zoom on here, it's been an interesting to do it all by myself. I don't know how you do it all. I mean, I, I guess I do. I used to do it. And then I had him on for like two years. And so it's been an interesting, uh, I guess, journey so far. So I appreciate you coming on and being like my first guest in God knows how long. Thanks so much, man. Not a problem. Glad to be here and uh, good luck with the rest of your stream. All right. Thanks, bro. I'll catch you later. Right. Talk to you later. Bye. All right. <laughs> that was awesome. What'd you guys think? Let me know in the comments, what you think about um, uh, Chris from Strongman Personal Finance. And you can go find him on YouTube. Again, at Strongman Personal Finance. You can find him on Twitter. Uh, he has a, a Facebook group as well. It was really awesome to uh, take up some of his time. And let me know what you guys also think about having future guests on too. Uh, this is something that, I, that I'm thinking about making, uh, maybe having some regular, regular guests on. Is Chris going to be a good fit? Do you guys think that uh, it would be worth having him on again. I think so personally. I thought it, was, thought it was a great conversation. Maybe we can kind of work him into more of the longer term approaches or on personal finance in general. Uh, I thought it was good, but let me know what you guys think. And if you want me to reach out to anyone else to have on the channel, let me know as well. Some really good, interesting stuff with uh, Chris from Strongman uh, Personal Finance. Um, uh, but um, what else is going on this week? We got earnings this week. So we have Nike on Monday, which is going to be certainly fun to watch. I'll be live to give those live reactions to Nike as well. Uh, that's There's also some really other in, uh, interesting ones too. So we have uh, Carnival. Uh, no, that's not Carnival Cruise. Not the, not the right one. Sorry. Um, we have Adobe on Tuesday after hours though. Then we also have uh, Winnebago, which I know it probably doesn't sound like Winnebago would be one that like actually worth would be worth taking a look at. However, Thor Industries just reported two weeks ago, and the RV industry is still on absolute fire. Uh, we take a look at uh, Thor, and it their earnings were were fantastic, and uh, I think that I think that uh, the Winnebago earnings could certainly uh, be do really well too. So let's take a look at Winnebago real quick. Pull up that chart here. So WGO is the ticker symbol. 
pull back out to the daily chart here. And it's actually at a reasonable level. So let's go ahead. I'll pull show you guys the chart here real quick. And um, again, this is probably a little bit riskier as far as, you know, looking at the chart. And, and if you're a technician uh, looking at this and saying, well, it's still downtrending and you can make that argument. We look at the fundamentals though it's got a forward pe of just five times next year's earnings and in, in an environment where we're looking at potentially record levels of uh, vac uh, uh travel due to vacation demand is still ridiculous you know with, with all the headlines that are um uh coming about with uh you know the russia ukraine situation and how that just continues to just really dominate all of the headlines across all of, all of media and social media COVID is is kind of like taking a bit of a back seat but the thing of it is, is that COVID is really taking a backseat in general. I think that there's a reason why we just aren't talking about it as much. We're seeing some flare-ups. Obviously, China has been a big problem as far as COVID is concerned. And I think that there is a lot of people that um, can make that argument that Omicron is still sticking around in many areas that could impact demand, especially when it comes to travel. But I don't think that that's going to be a thing. I think that we see um, people just learning to live with COVID as we continue to see strains come out and they're weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's just going to continue to be the theme in my opinion. And e as they come out and as people are learning to just live with this travel demand. And I think that this, this summer we're going to see some record travel numbers. So I think that that being said, I think that uh, Winnebago is still going to do well, even in an inflationary environment, even when gases are where they are, I still think uh, this is going to be a great company to just watch out for. So make sure you're watching this one. Uh, as earnings come out, I don't think that I would be owning this. I don't think I'd be running to go buy it, but I think it's certainly worth paying attention to when those earnings come out on um, on Wednesday. It'll be Wednesday morning. Then Wednesday afternoon, we have KB Homes. So KBH, you guys uh, know that this has been certainly one to continue to keep an eye on because of um, ooh, KBH. There we go. Because of the housing market and with rising interest rates, is demand really going to start to slow down because of interest rates going up? We saw mortgage rates go up to around 4% recently. And is this enough to get people to slow down on the buying and to where it's going to be, become a buyer's market? Now, I'm not and this is something that I think probably is a good question for Don from the Don Front Show because he is a real estate agent. But I think in my humble opinion, as someone who's not an expert in real estate, I would still say that demand's going to be there. And in, in fact, I think if people know that interest rates are going to continue to go up, that there's going to be a race to buy homes so that they can lock in those, those interest rates that are, that are here now, especially if they expect interest rates to go up to maybe four and a quarter or four and a half. Um, I think that would be, um, I don't know, a bit of a stretch in the near term, but I think that there's still that potential FOMO taking place to buy up homes. And again, we're still at a deficit as far as uh, supply and demand is concerned on, um, on the home buying front. So I think that this should be an interesting one to watch. We have DR Horton and Toll Brothers. Uh, I think Toll Brothers reported last, or no, Lennar, sorry. Lennar reported last, last week. So this is going to be interesting. They could have a tough road ahead of them because obviously the cost of things and how they're going to be able to pass that on the consumer. But right now, I think demand's still crazy. I think that the fact that this has come down may present itself an opportunity, but we'll see what those earnings look like next week as well. Uh, and so another one that might be interesting for you guys to watch out for and not one that I'm particularly a fan of. However, I know a lot of you folks were probably asking about it, and that is NEO. Neo is down, was down all the way down to 13 bucks from its, uh, what was that? 66, $67 highs. And has a re has had a recent bounce in response to all the Chinese, um, chatter that we've been having around, around regulation and how they're easing up on that and playing nice in the sandbox with the U S. So I think that, um, this is certainly has the potential to move up, but the fundamentals here are still just absolutely atrocious. And the fact of the matter is, is that Tesla's still going insane. Uh, not the stock, the company. And I think that the the growth here and the market share that Tesla is continuing to take up, as long as the Chinese continue to allow that to happen, I don't know if NEO is going to be the one to own, especially in the EV space. I could be wrong, and I have been before, but this is one that I would stay away from. They have earnings on Thursday after hours, which I'm sure will be uh, definitely, which will, which will make for an interesting stream. So make sure you guys are tuning in. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell to get notified when I do go live at 3.45 p.m. Eastern time 
on Thursday as I do every day during the week on Monday through Thursday. So, uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think. And let me know what you guys are watching this week as well as I take a look at some of the comments. Uh, some people were really appreciating Chris coming on. Um, uh, Kaz Pratt says, smart guy, I'd love to see him on more often to offer more a general personal finance perspective yeah definitely uh great channel this is a great channel for short ideas uh yeah okay uh is this guy is this michael yeah bye that was that was this is this is a two strike channel there's no three strikes you're out it's two that was the second one um as Stuart Castro says, great segment. Smart guy would love to. See, oh, yeah, we already got that one. And then uh, Oliver Thorpe said, uh, great conversation. Always good to hear other perspectives. Us good investors should always be seeking a variety of opinions. Absolutely. I agree with that as well. Um, well, Carnaweed, Weed, this is the one I was waiting for. Bro, what a race today. What a race today, Wakard. Any of my any of my friends, I mean, Wakard and Weed, not surprising, not surprisingly, as he lives uh across the pond in the UK, was super pumped for F1 for Formula One racing today. The second most popular sport in the world. Uh, and the US just does not appreciate it like we should. But I'm getting into it, Wakar. I mean, I, I've been into it over the last year, and last year I, I feel like was probably a good year to get into it because it's arguably the, one of the best seasons in the history of formula one and the way that today's race uh, sh uh turned out um yes i'm glad it's back and today's race was phenomenal it was awesome it was really good to see it was also really good to see red bull kind of take it on the chin as well so hope you're not a max fan <laughs> although i feel like every time i talk about it, there's a lot of max fans and then every every time i talk about max verstappen like i always get a bunch of hate about that but i can't stand that guy um, but let me know what you guys think if you guys watch Formula One. Also, I've been watching uh, March Madness too. If you guys have been watching that, Multigoya says I like the Traveling Trader. Yeah, maybe I'll try to reach out to to them uh, and see if uh, he'd be willing to come on the show. Um, Sheila Finn says I uh, haven't been in the chat room for a long time. Oh, nice. Good to have you back. Good to see you back. Um, but guys. That's kind of all I've got. It may be a slow week. I mean, I think overall the markets have potentially bottomed here. I say potentially because obviously there's a lot of things that could go wrong. But one thing I wanted to kind of just really uh, point out is that we are now, the S&P, for the first time in a minute, closed over the 200-day. I'm sorry, closed over the 50-day. And uh, I'm sorry, it did close over the 200-day moving average as well. On Friday. Interesting, interesting uh, move here because it hasn't been above the 200 day moving average since the middle of February. It hasn't been over the 50 day average uh, since God. January, right? So these are very interesting developments. Now, obviously, these are all indicators and we can't uh, just hang our hat on any one of them. But the momentum is certainly certainly there. Yeah. We know what you guys think in the comments. Are, are we? Did we finally see the bottom, or is there more pain to come? Would love to hear your thoughts on this. I think that we could, we potentially uh, could have seen that bottom. As you guys know, I'm fully invested here. I don't have any cash on the sidelines, and so I think that it's working out for me so far. So far, so good. I feel pretty good about it. Um. Oh, another one for traveling trailer trader. Okay. I'll try to see if I can reach out to him. And, 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 and in that, if you guys really want to see it, make sure you go on his channel and shout me out too. It, this is a, this is a, it takes a village because if the guy's never heard of me, he might not, might not give me the time of the day. But if he gets a couple of people or, or several people, um, you know, putting a bug in his ear, then I think that'll help. So, well, Carno Weed says, Christian, I can't stand Christian Horner Red Bull, but I was a class. Yeah. I'm in the same boat as you, bro. I'm in the same boat as you. Oh, my God. Thank God there's other people in my camp here. I like any other team than Red Bull and Max. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad there's some people in that camp. It was good to see Charles Leclerc win today, though. I like that dude. I like Ferrari in general. Uh, thinking about buying the Qs, Brad, what do you think, says Montagoya. Let's take a look at that. So the Qs... 
NASDAQ five, uh, the NASDAQ 100 ETF. So this is the top 100 stocks in uh, the NASDAQ. Just touched the 50-day moving average on Friday. We'll see if this continues. I mean, futures right now are super flat and super boring, so not really much going on. Um, and so I don't know. I, I think that there's potential. I, I, do I think that big tech is here to stay and it's not going anywhere and that it can outperform the rest of the market from here? I think that there's certainly that potential. I mean, you have major holdings in here. 25, I think it's 25% of uh, the the NASDAQ is made up of the, the big tech stocks, the FANG essentially, and Microsoft. So, and when we look at, at those and, and just how much they've come down, I think that there's definitely potential here. What I, what I buy the cues, I think that we tested this bottom and, and we passed. We passed this test down here at 318. Do you guys remember this? Remember when I went live and we were testing that 318 at the close? And I said that. I said, this, is, this could potentially be it. If this holds here, I think we're going to be in good shape. And damn that that didn't happen. Now, the next leg here is that if it does break over a 50-day moving average and meet that 200-day, I think that we do see some more momentum out of this. We're not anywhere near any kind of overbought situation. So I would say that there's, in the short and near term, I think that there's definitely some more potential for this to run. There, there's not really a whole lot more headwinds here, at least in the near to short term or near to midterm. So that's just kind of my thoughts on that. Let me know what you guys think as well on those um on the spy and what i was looking at on the cues um possible pullback on stocks a lot of stocks currently overbought i'd be curious to see to get your thoughts on this vicky because which ones are overbought in your opinion uh, and, and what's your what's your definition of overbought i mean even when you look at something like nvidia right like we're sitting at rsi at 60 not anywhere near overbought um and if it is overbought, how much does it pull back? Because you look at NVIDIA, right? Highs of 346, not anywhere close. CrowdStrike, for example, this is still, I mean, I think it was over almost 70% or 75% of the S&P 500 uh, was below the 50-day moving average. It was, it was an insane amount. CrowdStrike is overbought, says Vicky. I don't think so. I would, I would say I'd have to disagree. The only reason I'm saying this is because it just came from 156 sitting at 208, highs of 298. So it's still down 30%, nearly, nearly 30% from those highs. It's over the 50-day moving average. We're sitting at 61 RSI. So, I mean, I hear you. I think that maybe there's a few out there, but I don't think there's, there's many at all uh, that are oversold, um, at least, or overbought, sorry, uh, at least yet. Maybe we could get there this week. If the, the kind of buying that we saw last week continues and persists this week, then I might start to lean into that camp that you're in, Vicky. Um, but I'm not quite sure we're there yet. Um, could be wrong, but we'll see. Danny says, I think it's 25% on the S&P. I think it's closer to 50 for the NASDAQ. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and the NASDAQ, I mean, there were so many stocks in the NASDAQ right now that are down still, even after the recent moves, still down 70, 80 percent. So there's a lot more room for some of these to move if the money starts coming back in. I mean, uh, we're potentially seeing SoFi. I see uh, Venkat all there, uh, shutting out SoFi there. We are seeing SoFi potentially starting to maybe break a trend. Not yet ready to make that call. I think we still have to get up over the 50 day to even start thinking about that. But there's some promise here. Four straight days of green. You know, maybe maybe we see that. I, I, I own SoFi myself. I think that there's definitely a lot of promise there. I also own Palantir. These don't take up major positions in my portfolio, but um, I thought they were just came down too far to not maybe try to take a shot at it. Um, is Tesla overbought, asked Venkat. No, I don't think so. I think that it's overvalued. I've, I've thought that for a while. I still think it's overvalued. Um, we're sitting at a forward PE of 86. And sometimes that doesn't matter. So this is trading 86 times next year's earnings, even after the pullback from $1,243. So where it's sitting right now, that's, that's 86 times next year's earnings. I, I just don't see um, why that makes any sense. And I've, I've said this before. I think at some point in the EV craze, 
we're going to see like, so let me be clear. Tesla is definitely a good long-term hold. I think, I think that the company is not going anywhere and they're going to continue to take up market share in EVs and they're going to continue to do lots of great things in innovation. Um, so I think this is a great long-term hold regardless of where the stock is right now. I think it will be higher 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. However, I think that if we look at it and compare it to something like a Microsoft during the dot-com crash, the dot-com bubble, right? Let's take a look at Microsoft real quick. So we come out to the monthly chart. Look at this. Look at this move. Unbelievable, right? So each one of these candles represents one month. And if we go all the way out to 2001, you can see, obviously, the, the dot-com bubble burst came all the way down here. And it was sitting at $21 a share. So down at the bottom of the, near the bottom of the, of the bubble burst, it, it went from uh, 60, 50, and then sold off all the way down to 20, $21 and some change a share. Um, and, and, and during this time from 2001 to where we started to really see it ramp up again, oh, 2014, maybe. You can make that argument that like it hadn't really moved all, all that much until around 2013, 2014. So that's over a decade that the stock just went nowhere. Now, did Microsoft grow during that time? During those 10 years, 10, 12 years, did Microsoft actually grow as a company? Yes. You can bet their ass they did. Bet your ass they did. They grew significantly. I mean, unbelievably. And so I think that there's, there's potentially something like this coming for Tesla, right? Like this to me, when, when Microsoft went from 68 cents to uh, $60, $65 in 10 years time to crashing back down to earth to around $21 and then finally ramping back up again, I could see Tesla having the same type of trajectory. I'm not saying that it's going to, I'm just saying you can't make, you can make the argument that that could potentially happen, right? I mean, you can see that taking place. And this isn't to say that Tesla's going, that Tesla, the company, is going to go to shit, but there's definitely a, a point in which I could see this actually um, happening, kind of mirroring the same type of move, right? Ten years time, we went, and so if we go, you know, in '91, for example, Microsoft was trading at ninety some cents. What did I, whatever I just said, and so, you know, this is back in 2011 where Tesla was trading at four dollars. And then now where it's trading at 900, I think that there's going to be a leveling off. I think there's going to be a plateau until uh, the company catches up to the stock. And so, you know, not a lot of Tesla bulls want to hear that. Not a lot of them want to talk about it, but I think it's important to really kind of observe the bull and bear cases and kind of really look at things um, in this lens of, yeah, it's a great company and they're going to be around forever, but there's going to be potentially some pain here until we wait for, for this, for this to kind of catch up. I think that, that that's the argument that you can make for Tesla. I'm not saying that you shouldn't own it, even with it sitting up here, especially if you have a longer-term approach on it. But there's definitely uh, this, this mentality, I think, especially with a, lo a lot of uh, creators, YouTube creators, that just want to tell you all the good things that Tesla's doing and, and never really kind of give you any kind of other perspective. Um, because if you do, then you're just a Tesla Q guy, right? I'm anything but. I kind of want to. I want to. I want to emphasize that that I'm not trying to say that you should sh short Tesla. I just think that there's going to be a period in which it just does the Tesla. The stock just doesn't do shit. I think we're close. I think we're getting there, and maybe that comes in uh, in the form of you know what well, we don't have enough material to keep up with demand. I know that Elon's trying to address that, and maybe he does. I don't. I'm definitely not doubting the guy um, at all. But he's even made this point that there is a shortage of material out there to keep up with uh, raw materials, that, to keep up with demand, especially when it comes to batteries. So who knows? You know, like I said, maybe it just goes straight up forever. I hope for those who hold it, including myself, um, that it does. But I'm prepared for this to level off and kind of be boring for a little while until it starts to ramp up again. I mean, and that's the that's the nice thing about it, right? Because if we do if we do make the similar comparison to something like a Microsoft, and you can pull out any of the any of the big tech companies, right? Amazon, Apple, they all did the same type of move. But going back to this monthly chart, while it was dead for 10 years, 12 years, the next 10, I mean, just went absolutely crazy, absolutely insane. So this is why I still think that you know Tesla's a great long-term hold, but there could be some some pain for that. 
in the near to midterm future. Let me know what you guys think. I think there's some people that were giving me some comments on this. It says, um, Shock City Rocker said, I sold a bit of Tesla, super bullish, but there's a lot more room to fall than other stocks for sure. There's definitely some risk reward there. Let me guys, uh, and by the way, hit that like button. We got 33 likes. That's kind of on the weak side. That is on the weak side. Let me, let me know if you guys are liking the stream so far by hitting that like button. Um, okay. Long term, I think Tesla will be higher, but it could take four to five years to catch up to its current valuation. Yeah, that's kind of the camp I'm in, right? So if that's the case, then there's definitely potential for the stock to actually not move a whole lot between now and then. Um, it's just moved so much in such a short period of time that I think that th there's, we see this in stocks all the time. I just don't know what makes Tesla so different from that. Um, I mean, I firmly believe that Elon Musk is the, the Thomas Edison of our, of our time and there's not enough people that give him uh, that credit for it. So again, I just want to reiterate, this isn't an indictment on Tesla, the company, or even Elon. This is just how things work. This is how investors work a lot of times. Um, so Stuart Castro says, I'm focused on stocks that have good free cash flow. Palo Alto is 30 times uh, FCF right now. Yeah. Ca Palo Alto is best in business, best, best in class. I think that's a good one to own, especially in cybersecurity space, but still like a lot of the other ones too. Um, all right. Oliver Thorpe says, I do worry a, a bit for Tesla as it is a cult stock and we know how much they can rise and fall. Yeah, very emotional stock, right? Uh, great company for sure, but it's risky as I think catch up might be uh, quite a bit. So same, similar sentiment, similar sentiment. I think so too. Um, okay. I think this is also a great approach. I just dollar cost average in the Tesla with an average of 505. That's a great average, by the way. Um, really well done. But yeah. I mean, if you think that Tesla is a good long-term stock, then you just kind of treat it as if you were treating it like Apple, right? Or what have you. Um, so I think that those are all pretty decent approaches. You guys, most of you guys seem as if you're kind of in the same camp as myself. But um, love to hear you guys' thoughts and opinions on more of that if you're watching this at a later time too. And let me know again, guys, in the comments, if you're watching this later, if you enjoyed uh, the interview with Chris from uh, Strongman Personal Finance. I thought he was great. Would love to have him back on. Hopefully uh, he will as well. He feels the same way. And uh, I don't know. Maybe I, don't, I think I have to sharpen up my interview skills as well. You know, the only one way to do that is to have more people on. So let me know what you guys uh, are thinking, who you want me to reach out to. And uh, that's going to do for me, guys. I'll be back here tomorrow at 3.45 p.m. Eastern time. We'll go over those Nike earnings and give our reactions live to those. So make sure you guys are tuning in. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell because, guys, you're not going to want to miss it. All right. That's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for tuning in. As always, I'll see you all before the bell. And B. Smith is out. I can't believe I just said that. It came right out of my head. I didn't say that for like a year or two. Let me know if you guys in the comments have heard that me say that before. <laughs> all right, guys. Have a good one. See ya.